Good day, uh, Sanwanani, Dumelang, Molweni. Welcome to our live stream, which is about education researchers responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So today, Chat Education Service is launching their theme two, which is about NPOs in education during the lockdown. So to join in our conversation today is Dr. Rosana Rashab. So Dr. Rosana is an aspect in organizational development with a key focus on aligning vision and strategy with performance-driven implementation. She embraces a holistic approach involving research and development to find solutions for organizations, particularly keen on improving efficiency and performance. Roxana assists organizations to develop a culture of learning and inclusivity while working towards their strategic objectives and ensuring that diversity and transformation are embraced. So Roxana has been involved in higher education, national policy development, skills and entrepreneurial development for public, private and non-profit organizations and presents at national and international uh, conferences. She has shared her leadership skills over several years as a board member of organizations such as the National Skills Authority and South African Qualifications Authority, amongst others. She has a doctorate in management, innovation, and technology, and is currently an associate of Church Education Services, leading the post-school education training cloud project. So today, Dr. Anna is going to talk uh, to us about uh, NPOs in education during the lockdown, which is the which is the report uh, that she has been uh, the theme that she has been leading in the research boot camp. So, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming our guest, uh, Dr. Rosana. Rosana, welcome to the live stream. Hi, Lucidi. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Roxana, please tell us about your involvement in the research boot camp uh, that was, was held by Jet Education Services. Um, it was one of 12 themes that uh, Jet had as part of a boot camp, and we were invited to volunteer our time. We had just gone into lockdown, and um, it was such a lovely initiative to be involved in, um, especially since uh, several of the themes were looking at the response uh, of, of various sectors in education to COVID, the pandemic, and also the lockdown. Um, it was something that was obviously, to, it had taken us by storm. It was something that we were not prepared for. And uh, when I was asked whether I would um, offered to lead that theme. It was very interesting for me. It was something that was, um, it's very close to my heart because I've been um, involved in the initiation of the National Association for Social Change Entities. I led the establishment of it by assisting with the uh, establishment of the board for NASCI. Um, and so, at the heart of my work is how will NPO survive? How would they be responding? Um, how would this pandemic affect them and their organizations? So it was a theme that was just something that was a natural progression for me to get involved with. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, as you know, the boot camp, and you've been interviewing other research theme uh, leads as well. Um, was so interesting because it brought in a lot of young researchers, um, new graduates that didn't have experience, some of those that did have experience, and of course, uh, to be involved with this diverse you know, group of people showing interest in education, specifically uh, research as well, and then with the uh, nonprofit sector. Uh, bringing all of that diversity together was also a nice challenge for me. So I was very happy to be involved. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roxana. So NPOs in education during uh, the lockdown, it's a very, very interesting, interesting theme. Uh, myself, uh, knowing the importance of NPOs, uh, 
in our education sector or in our country generally uh what was the main purpose of this particular film um i think the first thing for us was to recognize the value of uh, non-profit organizations within the education sector um the kind of work that they put out it's largely for me an over you know an oversight by several as on several aspects of the kind of value that they bring to education um so for us the theme looked at what would their response be um and also from several aspects of their uh, um sort of their work the one was from a strategy point of view what were some of the new strategies that they would put together in the short space of time that they were given before the lockdown? How were they responding from a governance point of view with their boards? So we looked externally to how were they communicating with their stakeholders and their beneficiaries, um, as well as to funders. What were some of the response uh, in their communication to funders would be while they were locked down, what did they do to prepare their staff? So we looked at both external factors to the organization as well as internal factors. Um, largely, we did expect that with any closure and with any business being affected by closure, there would be funding issues. So we also wanted to know um, how has the lack of funding or sufficient funding in their reserves assisted them or didn't assist them. So there were lots of questions in our mind, um, but we looked at specific categories because in the short space of time uh, that the research was uh, you know, meant to take place over only one month from the beginning of April to the end of April, we were given a clear time frame. Uh, the volunteers were told, uh, you know, it's a quick turnaround. So it's not like any other research project where we have at least six months to a year. Uh, we had to be quite specific. We had to be very targeted in our questions um, and take the approach of something that was quite lean and mean. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roxana, for giving us uh, these um, clear objectives of this uh, particular film. So you mentioned that you, you were also looking at how these uh, South African NPOs were responding uh, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Can you please uh, share with us uh, how, how have they responded uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Okay, so we were quite fortunate in the sense that um, since the inception of NASCI, the National Association, uh, we had built up a nice database of NPOs in education. Um, I think it's one of the places where you can get clean data on NPOs and reach them in a short space of time through technology. So the obvious thing was to send out a survey form to South African NPOs um, in education. And uh, we've got a response of about 98 that responded to us. And the questions, as I said, were quite specific about what strategies they took uh, put into place, um, how were they being affected by funding, how were they actually liaising with the other stakeholders and their beneficiaries. And so the responses that we got, the CID, were quite varied. Um, there was a range of NPOs that responded from those that are large, well-established over a long period of time with a turnover of more than five million per year. And then you had those that are in the middle of the range NPOs, and then you had some that were very small. So the responses varied in the sense that obviously, you know, those that are well established, well funded, large projects are self sustaining. Um, they would need to put into strategies, they would need to change how they respond, um, you know, from previously, from before the lockdown to, to the current situation. But there was also about 40% of those that just shut down. They decided that they were not going to survive this, they can't pay their staff, or they would carry those costs, but they would um, not continue. Uh, you know, operating. Um, and then, of course, there was this whole 
um, area like any business, any other organization, if you didn't have the technology, you cannot continue. Because working remotely is largely based on how ready you are with technology. So I would say it, was, it, it varied depending on the size, it depending on their readiness to work remotely, and it did, depended largely on the funding um, that, that NPOs had. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roxanne. So uh, we see some of the NPOs, uh, they are active and they are, they are operating even during this uh, pandemic uh, crisis. So some, some, someone will wonder, um, what is the current status of NPOs in education uh, as a result of this COVID-19? What, uh, how would they, I didn't quite get your question. Okay, my, my question is, um, what is the current status of NP, N, NPOs in education as a result of this pandemic crisis? Okay, so I've mentioned that some of them have closed down. Um, the the whether it's a temporary measure is still to be seen i think they could there is reason for a follow-up uh, with those npos and there is um, a recommendation that there should be another uh, offshoot of this research that we can actually ask them more questions about um, why they closed how long did they anticipate closing what they anticipate doing later on but that was not the purpose of this uh, research. This one was to say, how are they responding? And so those that shut down, we couldn't obviously uh, probe any deeper. But the current status is that largely they are responding and they're responding well. Um, there are a, a, a large number of NPOs that are taking to online learning. Um, there have been a phenomenal response of NPOs uh, especially those that are involved in schooling, and I think more than 50% of those that are that we had surveyed were part of schooling that offered school um, language and and literacy and after school um, uh, learning. Um, and the the big divide between those beneficiaries that had the means of you know access to technology were obviously uh, it was quite obvious that they were going to gain in the learning process and so some npos also decided to put out uh, printed manuals and distribute them um, through the community structures so the the npos um, I think their focus, especially those in South Africa, because we also interviewed about 12 uh, well-established non-profit organizations in education internationally. And there was quite a difference in, in the kind of immediate response to the lockdown. In South Africa, the concern was the beneficiary, um, the community, and largely how would learning take place. The focus was, was on um, disruption of learning, uh, disruption of uh, uh, schools. Um, the lockdown was affecting uh, access to education. Uh, internationally, the biggest problem was funding. Would our donors still continue to fund the projects that they were already engaged with? Um, how do we then change strategy change how we work to make sure that funders have the confidence that we are sustainable and we will continue and that we will continue to receive the funding. Uh, what strategies would their governments and uh, policy makers, decision makers, uh, allow NPOs to continue with the kind of uh, reach of communities and, and teaching and learning? So there was a complete contrast with the concerns and empathy of our local NPOs uh, to in their response to making sure that uh, nutrition programs in schools uh, would continue. How would the school children that normally have, uh, a, you know, a food programs in school survive back at home now that they're not coming into school? Uh, how would teaching and learning continue? How would uh, parents be able to coach and mentor their ch their children uh, at home. So, uh, you know, you've seen this thrust of NPOs being concerned about their beneficiaries. Their second concern was, will we survive? Can we survive? Will we have sufficient funds? 
uh, a large number of them have reserves for about three to four months. What happens after that? How long would the lockdown last? And, and would we then uh, continue to be able to deliver the service that we do? So the status of, of NPOs, again, as I said, is varied. Those that are well established um, with good technology would actually be in demand because they would be able to deliver their service um, without being disrupted. And, and would be able to communicate with their staff, where their staff have access to technology, to data, to connectivity, to computers, uh, and, and shift gear into online uh, methodologies. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruxana, for giving us an overview of the current features of the NPOs in the education. So you also mentioned uh, in your explanation uh, funders as well. So with these challenges you also highlighted about NPOs, particularly in the education sector, how have the fathers themselves responded to this? And where does this leave NPOs? I think that the responders have realized that closer collaboration with NPOs are extremely necessary. Um, they have worked, for example, the Independent Philanthropy Association of South Africa, IPASA, and um, uh, has responded well in the call for funding, um, but largely it needs to be more coordinated. I think that's also come through quite clearly through the survey as well as um, during the lockdown process. Um, how can we help so that the funds that we give are distributed in a coordinated fashion um, we have experienced that before the pandemic where there's an overload of funding in certain areas and huge gaps in others. Um, so I think funders are now more aware that there needs to be more coordination, uh, there needs to be more cooperation between partners, that NPOs and funders need to partner. Um, the, the awareness of this was also brought to the attention of government. There was a uh, a, a good conversation, dialogue through uh, the NECT, um, where government was involved, the NECT coordinated it, NPOs were part of that conversation, uh, largely coming together. I think through the uh, pandemic and the lockdown, there was a lot of positives that have come out. Um, I think, you know, in bringing people together, in showing concern, in showing the need for partnering, um, uh, funders looking at making sure that, um, you know, they are aware of what work is being done, where the, the, the funding funds are needed, and, and how much to put into which area. Um, and then through this, at the same time, um, was the launch of EdVision, which is the platform that brings funders and NPOs together. It's only just been recently launched, um, was not part of the survey, but I'm aware of it, and that's why I mention it now. Uh, but it talks directly to your question of what are funders doing, and how are funders responding, and how to actually gain access to who are the NPOs, where are they actually operating, what are their main core business. And so that matchmaking through a platform like Edvision would go a long way. Um, the survey um, and the research that we've done um, through some key interviews as well as the questions that we asked and some focus groups as well with the NASCI board, for example, uh, highlighted all the things that we did anticipate and we did suspect that these would be challenges but i think with any research it becomes evidence-based you can now go and say we did survey and we have got these as findings and we are now right recommending that this go to the next level so i i would say uh, there's been good collaboration between funders and NPOs. There's a lot of channels of communication open now. Um, social um, investments can be channeled in a more uh, coordinated fashion as opposed to, you know, some funders not knowing what other funders are doing, etc. And NASCI can play an absolute coordinating role as the central body in bringing all these stakeholders together. So far more than collaboration, we need coordination and then cooperation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roxana, uh, for giving us an overview of the funders, of how they respond um, to us this uh, situation that the NPOs uh, are experiencing. So, um, having read my, the report myself, um, I have seen some comparative analysis are there, uh, especially about the South African NPOs um, responses. Uh, how do they differ to, towards international NPOs uh, in this particular research? Okay, so I might have I might have been anticipating that question and I might have answered it already a little bit. Um, but it was surprising that when we did interview the international uh, NPOs, their immediate response was their main concern was not technology and not connectivity and not the cost of data uh, like we have in South Africa. Uh, it was more about their funding mechanisms, uh, their sustainability, uh, how can government help them, what would their relief funds look like. Um, the other, I think, difference is that um, other governments, and I won't say that in all countries, because we only interviewed one NPO in each country. For example, uh, in the UK, in London, there was one established NPO. So I can't generalize it to the country. but. In a, in a number of these interviews, international interviews, um, the governments were allocating funds for specifically nonprofits, the nonprofit education sector. Um, it was ring fenced, it was relief for NGOs and the work that they do. Whereas here we found that while we do have uh, funding relief from government, um, it is all you know, broadly for organizations and entities that apply for the funding and not specifically for how do we, these are the strategies we're going to use to engage with NPOs. These are the strategies we will bring NGOs on board or NPOs on board uh, on how we're going to work. So we're still in that conversation. We're still uh, looking at what government strategies and policies are and how we fit in and how we're going to get involved in key projects in assisting government. At the same time, I think the spread of that funding is so wide that um, funders, philanthropists, and social investors would have to, uh, I think, in, at this point, be more involved than government would from a funding perspective. So that's basically the difference that we found through the survey uh, and through the research, um, you know, the interview aspect between the international uh, counterparts and, and ourselves locally. A very interesting uh, comparative analysis uh, right there, Dr. Rosana. And again, maybe uh, highlighting to us what we can learn from other international NPOs and as well what government can learn from other governments as well. It's a very interesting one. So um, can you please give us an overview of the critical recommendations of this particular research that you have conducted with your team? Okay, so I think the first one is that there should be closer collaboration between government and NPOs. I think government needs to understand the role of NPOs precisely and the value that they bring as, a, as one of the key stakeholders to education. Um, because clearly, I mean, we've had this already where we, we realized that there were gaps in the education system and that, you know, as co-partners, uh, we can assist government as non as nonprofit organizations. So that closer collaboration is one of the key things that we you know uh, we are recommending, um, and that the conversation is deepened um, into actual implementation. Um, I think the second one is where there is um, the the coordination between all stakeholders from a funding perspective. Um, the, you know, and, and I've mentioned that already. The third one is to look at our technology, to look at our readiness to work remotely. I think we talk about the new, the new norm, the new normal, um, and, and, you know, we just, when, when you throw phases around and you use it often enough, people think they know what it means. Uh, but what does that actually translate into for technology? We have to look at the cost of data. Um, we are in Africa and the rest of Africa is cheaper than us. Uh, so we have to look at that. Um, and, and, and if we are going to be using some of these ways of working, the new normal ways of working through technology, um, then 
the cost of data, connectivity, and access to technology is extremely important because I don't think we're going to go back to the old ways of working. So largely, those are the three main things. I think the other recommendation is for NPOs uh, to realize that they need to have short-term solutions, uh, policies um, that allow them to be agile, to be able to be responsive. Uh, to be able to have the capacity to deal with contingencies at short notice. Um, so that's a huge lesson as well. So those are just some of the, the recommendations that I can think on the top of my head. Thank you very much, Atok Sarosana. Those are very, very critical recommendations and strategies that you just outlined right there. And this brings us uh, to the end of our conversation. Thank you very much uh, for making this time and joining us into our live stream and sharing these uh, very important uh, insights. Uh, I'm sure the viewers uh, at home, or everyone who has managed to tune in, they really learned something within this short period of time. And uh, thank you to the viewers as well who managed to tune in. Uh, we are live on YouTube. So in case you missed the part of the, the conversation, you can go back and listen to it. So just just before I close the, the interview or our conversation, Dr. Roxana, any final ways that you like to say? Oh, yes, of course. Um, you know, I you can never do a piece of work like this in such a short space of time all by yourself. You have to have sufficient support and sufficient help. And my co-partner, co-lead in this was Louise Albertain, and she was phenomenal in assisting me to pull this together. Um, we had a phenomenal group of young researchers, each doing a uh, different aspect of the research, and that's how we accomplished getting it done so quickly. Some did uh, focused on governance and, and uh, you know, communication. Some looked at funding, some looked at technology. So we split the work and it, it is really their, their assistance is, is appreciated. And of course, we've had uh, three phenomenal moderators that assisted us and guided us through some of our research, gave us feedback. They, we appreciate their time, Sarah Rennie from IPASA. Um, we had Nick Rocky and we had uh, Mr. Duncan Hindle uh, with, with NICT and, and their valuable contributions is appreciated. And of course, Jet for giving me the opportunity and, and being um, you know, so proactive in, in, how, in looking at how and investigating how we can find ways and solutions through research uh, to assist policy as well as uh, implementers. So I want to thank all of them very quickly. <laughs> Dr. Roxana, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you and chatting to you, Lisedi. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. You so are we done. Can, so we can relax now. <laughs> you 